This is the second set of notes on Unit 10, Evolution and Taxonomy. This one is about evidences of evolution. So there are four main kinds of evidences of evolution, and we're going to elaborate on each one. This is the list here. We have fossils that are similar to modern species but different. We have biogeography, which has to do with locations of related groups of, of uh, fossils. We have homology, which is similarities in uh, ancestry and in organisms, and Darwin called this common descent. And we have vestigial structures, which are structures that are no longer used and used and are reduced in size. So first of all, we have fossils. Remember, fossils are usually embedded in geological layers of sedimentary rock. They often resemble modern species. When you look at uh, fossils, you need to realize the ones that are in deeper layers are older, and the ones that are in shallower layers are more recent and usually more complex. There are also such things as index fossils. Index fossils are used um, as a way to date the relative ages of different um, layers of rock. An index fossil is something that lived for a relatively short time, geologically speaking, and was pretty widespread. So when you find a layer of rock that has this particular fossil in it, you don't know about how old it is. And so fossils in this same layer will be about that age, or ones that are upper, uh, above it will be younger, and ones below it will be older. Here we have uh, a couple of things about a couple of diagrams about fossils. Of course, this is showing you that the deepest rocks have the oldest fossils, usually more simple than the ones that are higher up, closer to the surface. And this, this diagram shows you that you can use the type of fossils that you find to tell what kind of environment the uh, was it in, around at that time? If you uh, find samples that have clamshells and shark teeth in it, you'll know that it's somewhat like a marine or coastal, semi-coastal environment. If you have find pollen grains and clamshells, then that means that you're a little bit farther in. You've got some trees there. And if you find pollen grains and elk skulls, then that lets you know that it's even farther inland. So the type of fossil that you find in a particular kind of rock can let you know some things about the environment at the time that the rock, uh, that the rock was formed. Um, here we have a couple of fossils, well, not a fossil, but we have a woolly mammoth that was actually uh, unearthed from a, from a uh, glacier, and we have a modern-day elephant. There's a lot of similarity in the structure of them. They probably had a common ancestor. You see there's a tusk, a, a t trunk here, like the elephant's trunk, they have t long tusks. Elephant has tusks also, and size is very large. These are very, very large animals. Okay, but notice this is very furry, okay, and it lived in a much colder time, and so you can tell some things about, about the time that it lived um, because, of, because of that kind of structure. Modern, these died off about 10,000 years ago. Um, modern day elephants survive in a much warmer environment, so they are a little, they're adapted differently for their environment. Fossils form by a, when a, a specimen, let's say a T-Rex, as we see here, gets covered in water and eventually covered in sediment. And after many layers of sediment are added on top, then uh, the rock over time will form and the uh, bones that are embedded there will fossilize. And eventually that may be uplifted and eroded away so that you find a fossil elevated to closer to the surface and can see where it is and what it is. A biogeography has to do with fossils that are located in different uh, locations on Earth. Um, the remarkable thing about this, when we look at um, fossils of various kinds that are found in different places, it gives us an idea of what the world looked like once upon a time. This shows the southern part of um, Pangaea, which was also con called Gondwana land, and it shows the, the distribution of fossils that have been found in these different continents, which gives us an idea of what this part of Pangaea looked like, and also the fact that there were that there was development that took place uh, and movement of these different kinds of organisms in different places. Here we have Cynonathus, which is a, a land reptile okay, that lived uh, in both South America and Africa, although when they were connected still as part of Gondwana land. Here's another one called Lysistrosaurus, Lysistrosaurus, sorry. And this green swath here that covers all five of these southern continents is uh, for a fern plant called Glossopterus, which was found in all of those southern continents, and shows that they were once joined together, very widely distributed. These are things that couldn't have swum from one place to another. 
So the indication is that they were all joined together and that, that the animals were traveled and the plants were distributed across that landmass. Homologous body parts have similar origin and different functions. They have similar origin, oftentimes similar structures. Here you see the four limbs of four different mammals, and you see they have the same kinds of bones. We have a, a humerus, a radius, and ulna, carpals in the wrist, metacarpals in the hand, and the phalanges. And you see the same sorts of bones in all of these different animals, but they're shaped, they're organized in the same direction, and they come from the same kind of origin, but they are shaped a little bit differently because the limbs have different functions. The human arm is for grasping and holding, cats climb and, and um, run. The whales use their fins to, um, to swim through the water, and of course the bat uses its um, forelimbs for flight. So homologous body parts have similar origins, different functions, um, and that leads us to believe that they probably had a common ancestor. Here's another diagram showing you just the same sort of thing. It shows a few extra things. Here's the bird. Notice it's in the bird. Some of the uh, bones have been fused together. Uh, in the horse, the phalanges have been fused together into a, into a hoof. Frogs have fewer um, phalanges than, than humans do, and some of the bones are fused together instead of having a radius and an ulna. They have a fused bone called a radio ulna. <laughs> Another homology is homology in embryology. When we look at the embryos of these different animals, notice that they're, that they're going from top to bottom rather than left to right. Okay, you can see that in the earliest stages, all these embryos look very, very much alike. I would have a difficult time telling them apart, as would you. In a little bit later stage, they're a little bit easier to tell apart. At least some of these are, okay, the, the fish and the, and the uh, amphibians and reptile and bird are somewhat similar to each other. Fish and amphibian, much more different. But the mammals look very still, very, very similar to each other until they get closer to the final stages to for, for, before birth. Again, because they have structures and um, um, appearances that are very similar, they probably had a common ancestor that had similar developmental stages in the past. Another homology is similarity in DNA. We're talking about genes here. There are sets of genes called Hox genes that are groups of genes that control different parts of the body. And we find the same groups of genes that are very similar biochemically um, to each other in both fruit flies and in humans. You'll see that the red ones here control the, the top of the head, just like they do in humans. Um, the um, light blue ones control the, the abdomen area here and so forth. And so there's a lot of similarity in, uh, um, in the genes themselves and also in the body parts that they are in control of, of uh, developing those parts. Another, a fourth um, and final evidence of evolution is vestigial organs. These are organs that have been modified over time and oftentimes they're parts that are lost or almost lost. Uh, they are small traces of homologous organs that are no longer useful in the modern species and so they're reduced in size. An example is in snakes. Some snakes have um, little bone spurs that look like, that probably were the remains of limbs because snakes at one time in the far distant past had a common ancestor who did have limbs. Also in your eye, in the inner corner of your eye, the little um, pink blip there in the corner is called the pica and the pica is um, the remains of an inner eyelid. Another example of a stigial organ in humans would be like your appendix. The appendix, which is attached to the very beginning part of the large intestine, where it attaches to the small intestine, probably is the remains of a much longer and more complex digestive system that human ancestors needed when they ate a lot more plant food, which takes a lot more um, digestive system to break down the plant material. This concludes the notes on um, evidences of evolution, and we'll continue on with uh, the next part in the next video.